policies for uh, for all the target areas that we've mentioned before, uh, above, but also inclusive policies and regulations and um, the, the, the corresponding frameworks uh, as far as adoption for all the four areas is concerned. And the fourth, uh, the fourth also um, focus area was increasing budget allocation by, uh, by respective governments. And this time we were basically looking at uh, county governments, but also the national government. Um, in Kenya, Basically, looking at food, food uh, FNS and um, looking at FNS. Uh, beyond FNS, we we were also ha having other thematic areas. But th today, basically, we are looking at FNS, and the main three organisations that were focusing that were basically focusing on this uh, this particular thematic areas was soccer, cats, and sack dip. Um, the main role that was being played by this year's was, was uh, consumer awareness, um, and the focus here was basically stimulation of uh, demand for safe food. And the second one, um, the second focus was uh, policy uh, dialogue. Um, the CSOs here basically they focus on uh, initiating national and county level um, policy dialogues that would be able to bring um, different stakeholders around uh, the different MSPs that had been formulated within this particular space. And then also a uh, promotion of uh, public and private uh, partnerships. Um, <clears throat> The fourth one was basically um, focusing on evidence. As I've, I've, I've said that the main emphasis for us as Voice, Voice for Change was basically uh, evidence generation. And uh, what the, this particular three organizations were doing was um, generating evidence in collaboration with uh, the various uh, think, tank, think, think tanks and policy uh, advocates that we were working with. Uh, for this project, IFPRI was our main um, think tank. It was the main uh, research organization that led in the in the formulation of uh, basically in the in the research uh, endeavors and basically being able to present uh, scientific research that would be able to uh, help us in terms of uh, engaging with uh, the various policy uh, policy makers. Um, uh, I basically joined this particular project this year. Um, <clears throat> it, that was around around January. But uh, the person I succeeded as uh, basically was um, part of the people that started this particular project, and uh, she's basically a guru in this particular sector. And um, I would want at this juncture to introduce um, Mary Njuguna, who was basically uh, my predecessor, and currently is part of the global uh, global team at SNV, um, focusing on FNS. Uh, Mary, please um, welcome for your, for a few remarks. Yeah, thank you so much, John, um, for that brief um, introduction of what Voice for Change has been doing um, in Kenya. So I'd like to uh, bring on board Mary Njuguna uh, to give us her brief on Voice for Change and the global perspective as the Voice for Change Global Advisor for FNS. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much, Brenda, uh, for the introduction, as well as John. In my highlights, we'll uh, mention uh, what led to our choices in working with the uh, uh, post-harvest loss and food safety uh, in the Voice for, uh, for Change project. Yeah. We think it is an important area. And of course, uh, this comes, of course, is informed by national strategy. Uh, big four agenda uh, focuses on the third agenda on uh, food security. We think that two topics of food safety and post harvest loss are critical uh, for food security, and therefore it is a priority, considering also that the uh, government of Kenya wants to achieve at least 100% food and nutrition security for all Kenyans as discussed in the agriculture strategy for transformation and growth. Um, and also, it is also a priority by other regional organs, uh, African Union, if you think about the Malabo Declaration uh, for food security and post-harvest laws is prioritized. And our initiative is also in line with what is provided within the SDGs. So in making this choice, 
we think it is important that various actors, uh, private sector, government, and research institutions bring together their energy um, to support this very important sector. Uh, bearing in mind also we are coming from a context in Kenya where a majority of the Kenyans are uh, living their livelihoods uh, from agriculture, especially the smallholder farmers. We focused on horticulture and dairy. And the reason we did this because uh, we had experiences in these two sectors. We were implementing uh, the Kenya market-led uh, horticulture and daily, daily projects. Both are big sectors, promising, uh, contributing not only to food and nutrition security, but also to the economy. If you think about uh, horticulture contributing about 36% uh, to the GDP, they uh, contributing uh, uh, three, let's say three to 4% of the GDP, Therefore, they are important sectors. They provide uh, great potential for the country and for the population. However, in our implementation of the value chain oriented projects, we came across key systemic challenges that prohibit the further development of these particular subsectors. And that is why we chose uh, the two topics. Uh, we cross uh, the continuing challenge of uh, milk quality assurance. It was a persistent challenge in the dairy sector. Very limited consumer awareness uh, on food safety. And you found that mostly it was the processors that could, in some situation, uh, raise the concern. Uh, there was also, we thought and we found, um, a weak enforcement of uh, quality regulations. And that's why we thought that uh, this would be an important area. The same applied to the horticulture sector, uh, which is highly fragmented and therefore has to manage uh, the value chain. On both cases, you found that most of it is um, oriented towards the informal. In fact, in both cases, more than 80% is domestic led and um, most of the regulations that are applied for external, especially the export sector, were not in application. So in this case, that motivated our interest. We also came across opportunities in the dairy sector. There were, in, in this case, uh, an opportunity uh, supported by the Netherlands government on milk quality based payment scheme. Uh, a pilot was implemented with the private sector, and we began to see that there is potential for this kind of pilot, pilot to be upscaled and taken up by more private sector so that we can safeguard um, the sector. The same applied to uh, horticulture. We worked with a pilot where we were looking at potato storage, we were looking at technologies that can support uh, improved uh, uh, post harvest management, especially in the potato uh, industry. So with this, we were persuaded that we needed to work on those two and bring it forward uh, for uh, advocacy with the private sector and government and, and civil society. We saw that uh, even if organizations like SMV and many others have worked for many years, uh, supporting the value chains. Particular issues may, uh, remained very systemic and uh, could not be addressed by uh, one of projects. And that is why with Voice for Change, we have embarked on a multi-stakeholder approach where we bring on board a private sector uh, who can um, look at how they can invest in these particular elements uh, to support uh, for example, with technologies that can uh, support food safety, but at the same time also support post-harvest loss management. Public sector is the main um, uh, partner on this project, engaging with the government to look at uh, how we can change the rules of the game, how we can implement regulations and policies. And on the basis of that, uh, bring more systemic and sustainable change. And the role of research, of course, was important. 
And therefore, the reason that we have this today's engagement, where we find that for government to be able to implement uh, policies, they have to be founded on uh, clear evidence and evidence that uh, will and, and knowledge that will direct the areas in which they should invest. The role, the role of civil society cannot be gainsaid. If you looked at the agriculture sector previously, we haven't been able to see so much uh, engagement of private of civil society organizations. Civil society organizations have their role. Um, they represent the voice of the masses. They represent the voices of the uh, smallholder farmers. And they do have a role in uh, participating in policy and budget making processes. And in this project, we've worked with civil society organizations to strengthen their ability to engage with government. And one of the things that we've been able to do is to build that partnership between the civil society organizations and research institutions such as IFPRI to be able to consolidate material. And therefore, the studies that we, we are going to show today, some of which have actually been shared uh, with a, a couple of uh, county governments, uh, comes from work that has been collaboratively in, improved. I think it is in collaboratively uh, developed. I think it is important to note that civil society do have a, a place at the table and with concrete um, evidence, uh, they have been able to work together collaboratively with the, uh, with the government um, and, and add value. So we are inviting you to this session to listen to um, part of the evidence that has come that shows that we need to take action now. And our appeal to the respective government, um, this initiative fits into your agenda. It supports your uh, your, your performance, and therefore, please uh, choose to take action. Um, implement the food safety uh, strategies and policies that have been developed over the past four years. Invest in food system and invest in post uh, harvest management. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mary, for your words. And um, those are very pertinent thoughts um, to provide in regards to food safety and um, how Voice for Change has been involved in the movement towards um, ensuring there's food safety, nutrition, and post harvest loss being addressed um, at the county and the national level. And as the name itself is, we are a partnership um, project. And this would not be happening without the assistance of the Embassy of the Netherlands. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Rose McKenzie, Policy Officer uh, for Food Nutrition Security at the Embassy of the Netherlands to give us a few words and um, thoughts on how the Embassy is viewing food safety in Kenya and how Voice for Change has been able to um, contribute to this particular agenda. So welcome, Rose. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to join you today on this webinar. Online workshops and meetings have become the new normal, it seems. But this new normal might be having its new advantages. However, it's no replacement to face-to-face -face interactions during plenary or during tea or lunch breaks. But well, we'll work with this for now. Let me start by saying that food security and specifically food safety and food loss are two topics close to the heart of food security initiatives funded by the Netherlands government in Kenya. The Voice for Change partnership being among these initiatives is a good example. This is especially so since access to safe foods and reduced food loss are key factors in ensuring food and nutrition security at household level, community level, and ultimately at the country level. The focus today, as we've been told, is on food safety. As you know, we are concerned about food safety, especially in our domestic market here in Kenya. The export market, we can safely say, is well covered on food safety measures. Through the Dutch-funded initiatives, issues on food safety that we have 
we have grappled with in the domestic market broadly span across weak or inadequate regulatory frameworks, insufficient enforcement, challenges around incentive mechanisms, and low levels of awareness among all consumer segments. One of the initiatives funded by the embassy, known as the three known as the 3R Kenya Project, conducted a meta-analysis on transformation of the dairy, horticulture, and aquaculture sectors, which, by the way, are the three main value chains the Netherlands and Kenya focuses on. Among the insights and conclusions that were drawn from this meta-analysis was that a growing consumer awareness about food safety issues can trigger transformation towards more sustainable production and traceability. Now, the simple bottom line is that it is because of the consumer that we are concerned about food safety in the first place. And by the way, we are all consumers for this matter. Therefore, if consumers are the change agents and their levels of awareness on food safety is what will tip the balance and bring about the change needed, then evidence generation is a requirement to demonstrate and substantiate the various aspects of food safety that the consumers need to be aware of and demand for. This evidence generation is key also for the policy makers and regulators and the relevant value chain actors for them to appreciate the food safety situation and respond accordingly. Equally important is the presence of strong civil society organizations that will pick up the evidence generated and bring about awareness through advocacy targeted at different segments of consumers and at the same time, lobby policymakers and regulators and the relevant value chain actors. I would like to acknowledge that the Voice for Change Partnership has worked with consumer groups to contribute towards raising awareness among consumers on food safety. It is work in progress. And one of the things that I would be curious to hear is how consumer or consumer groups can be used to track budgets for accountability and investments in food safety. In the end, the overall goal is that there will be unity of purpose from all concerned with ensuring and promoting food safety of the agri produce, whether for international markets and or for domestic markets, but specifically for domestic markets, as here is where the challenge is. Now, more than ever before, human health is currently on top of the global and national agendas. There is an emphasis focused on the need to consume nutritious food in order to boost one's immunity. We cannot talk of nutritious foods and fail to ensure food safety of what is consumed. Therefore, there is, there, there is no better time than now to talk about food safety and the resources required for accountability and investment in it. Food safety remains to be a critical human right factor and a target to SDG2 on zero hunger. Therefore, both the duty bearers and the rights holders must continue to put in effort, to put in effort to ensure that food safety is accessible, affordable, and adequately available. In the multi-annual country strategy of the Netherlands in Kenya, food safety remains a focus theme under the food security strategic pillar and the embassy seeks to build on the work done by previous and ongoing projects on food safety, especially at the governance level. I will stop here and not take any more of our time. I look forward to the presentations and discussions lined up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria, over to you. Uh, so much, Ruth, for your presentation. Um, and as we can see, it's, it's quite clear that um, without partnership and um, working together with national county government um, and all other development partners, uh, we cannot achieve what we want to achieve in um, safety and nutrition. Uh, without much ado, I would now like to uh, move to our next segment where we have key presentations from um, IFPRI and ILRI team, RESAX, who have done extensive research and um, provided evidence products for the Voice for Change uh, partnership uh, program to use to advocate for policy changes and for budget um, investment in food safety and nutrition. Um, our first, Dr. Paul um, Bubiga, he works with Ilri Research 
as a senior policy analyst, and I'd like to let him um, share his, his views and um, share the highlights of the research that they've done on food safety and budgets. So Dr. Paul Gudiga, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brenda. Good morning, everyone. I will be taking you through <clears throat> Uh, a presentation on food safety budget tracking, which I am sharing now. And I hope that everyone can see it. And the, the outline of the presentation, I will begin by giving an introduction, um, then make a case on why public sector intervention is needed in food safety then why we need to track budgets, uh, what are the desired features of a good uh, budget tracking system. Uh, I will also present an overview of the budget uh, tracking tool that we have um, uh, you know, uh, made or together with the CSOs and the, the, the government, county government and the national government provide some highlights of the budget tracking results and also give some conclusions. As a way of introduction, I think it has been already mentioned that dairy and horticultural pro uh, products are a major food item among the Kenyan consumers. And the observable trends is that this is going to continue to increase. In fact, for example, milk consumption per capita will reach about 220 liters by 2030. We also know that vegetables are consumed regularly uh, uh, by every household actually in Kenya. Over 80% of uh, production of uh, um, uh, vegetables is actually consumed domestically. It is also uh, telling that uh, the dairy and horticultural products are among those that are implicated in uh, most of the food uh, borne diseases and uh, they are actually an important focus of regulatory agencies. So then the question is, the composited animal manure when you are growing vegetables, excessive use of uh, pesticides and fertilizers. In urban areas, we even have problems of uh, using untreated sewerage water, uh, production on the roadsides in urban and peri-urban areas, among others, and the pictures there show some of these challenges. From the farm, as we transport these products to the market, there are uh, challenges also uh, of contamination. For example, we have seen uh, vegetables being uh, transported in open trucks that pass through dusty areas. Uh, Sometimes they use contaminated bags and also unhygienic handling. Uh, we have seen even the struggle with the milk, uh, where we even it's transported using uh, banned plastic containers in motorbikes, etc. That does not stop even at marketing stage, where we have challenges with poor hygiene in our markets, where people sell along walkways, and even in uh, next to waste heap. So we have challenges across. Uh, the whole uh, uh, value chain. So then the question is, why is public intervention required? Uh, food six, that is why government must come in. Because if we are to leave it to the individual producers and traders, they don't have any intrinsic incentives to control any of the food safety hazards. They get their milk, if it's contaminated, the consumer doesn't even know and they sell it, they are, th that ends there. Um, the other issue is that the negative impacts of food safety hazards, for example, foodborne diseases, reduced productivity, treatment costs, all these fall back to the public sector because those people who uh, you know, will, will get sick will need treatment, etc. There is also an issue of information asymmetry, very common between buyers and sellers. For example, a seller of milk may have preserved it using um, you know, a chemical, for example, hydrogen peroxide or formalin, for example. They know, but the, seller, the buyer doesn't know. 
And therefore, there is need for government to actually intervene to sort out that problem. So in essence, if food safety is left to the private actors, they will be under investment. We'll have socially suboptimal levels of food safety. So therefore, that is why we have the public sector coming in, establishing standards and control, investing in infrastructure and enforcement. And for this to happen effectively, and at the best level that is socially optimal, you have to have money to do it. You have to budget for it and you have to utilize those uh, budgets. Uh, and therefore, why then about, why are we talking about this budget? Because one of the challenges we have is the insufficient investment um, that leads to suboptimal performance, if you like. And therefore, uh, you can already see that then we need to actually put in money, uh, budget and utilize that money uh, towards achieving food safety, but also we need to track because those who are responsible, both the national and county government, need also uh, to be held uh, to account for their uh, commitment. And that is one of the uh, theories of change in this Voice for Change uh, project. And therefore, the, the tracking of food safety was identified as an integral part, and that is why we had this activity. And um, again, uh, the political will for investments in any given public policy issue, whatever it is, must be reflected in not only the budgets, but the actual expenditures. And I think we'll come back to this because the two sometimes don't align. Something may be budgeted, but not spent. Um, and that is a challenge. Um, the other thing is that you know, identifying and tracking this financial commitment is also a complex issue, as you will see, because food safety um, happens or is tackled in different uh, ministries, if you think of it. Think of agriculture, think of health, think of trade and industry, and many others. And there are so many projects and activities under each. And for you to be comprehensive, you want to bring all these budgets and expenditures together to get a full picture of what is happening. This uh, method of budget and expenditure tracking has been used in other countries also uh, by uh, even Nancy Doctors for Advocacy. If you look through those examples that are presented there, it is actually used. Uh, therefore, in this project, we borrowed from the, uh, the, the international best practice, as as IRI uh, and IFPRI, working closely with SNV the CSOs, and also working very closely and collaboratively with the county government and national government, developed a, a methodology for tracking our budgets and expenditure for food safety in both the dairy and the horticulture sector in Kenya. So what are the desired features of our budget tracking system? First, it should be comprehensive. As I said a moment ago, food safety issues run across uh, different ministries, different sectors. And you want to ensure that that system of tracking captures all the activities in different sectors, in different ministries. It, for it to work well, it, there should also be timeliness. That is financial information being available on a regular and a timely basis. I think for Kenya, we are doing uh, well as far as especially budgets are concerned. Even county governments post uh, their budgets online, the same with the national treasury, so the budgets are available. But as I will say later on, the expenditures come with a, a huge lag of about three years. But at least for most of the counties and, nation, and the national government, this information is, time, is available in a timely way. Then it should be made uh, user friendly. We have tried to do that. I think any of you who has looked through financial uh, documents from Treasury or from county government. They are quite bulky. They have full of, of a lot of details and numbers, and sometimes it's difficult to use them. Therefore, a, a budget tracking methodology has to have some ease of use. Uh, so, uh, there should also be alignment and, uh, so that there is um, the CSOs themselves 
must own it. The county government and the national government must see it as their own so that when we pre you present the results, then they can identify and say, yes, here uh, we need to do better. So how do we op operationalize it? As I said, it's food safety is multi-sectoral. You have to bring in health, agriculture, trade, water, everyone. And therefore, the question then is, what constitutes spending on food safety? You have to examine in details all the budget lines. So you, you start by the relevant um, uh, budget uh, activities in different um, sectors, in different ministries and even department agencies like the dairy board, or AFA, the, the um, horticultural directorate, then there is the issue of budget lines being very specific to food safety and some others being not direct but contributing to uh, food safety. And therefore, you have to have, for the ones that are assigned 100% of the weight, but others that run in between, you have to assign a proportionate weight and how to go about that as, as i will explain later is an issue of uh, expert opinions with the uh, people who execute the budgets it's an issue of uh, consultation and also building consensus in terms of what weight will be appropriate uh, uh, to apply uh, to a portion a certain uh, budget uh, to food safety activity so then, as I have been saying, you have to distinguish the food safety specific interventions and then the food safety sensitive interventions. They may not be direct, but as you build capacity uh, of um, maybe the, the extension uh, officers uh, to communicate messages of food safety, uh, there's an element there that you must apportion to. So the, the steps include uh, that we followed. Number one is to identify the daily and what kind of food safety activities. Um, so in system, so you look at the programs and then there's a program uh, level in uh, how the uh, budget lines are coded. The Yeah, um, I've um, lost Dr. Karugia um, for a bit there due to some internet connection. We'll try and get him back, uh, but I think what we can do um, in the interest of time is uh, that we can move to our next presentation as we get Mr. Dr. Gudiga back. And our next presentation um, is ideally looking. Oh, sorry. I think Dr. Gudiga is back. Hi, Brenda. Dr. Gudiga. Yes. Brenda, I'm here. Oh, the thank you, Paul. I think I had lost you for a minute. Okay. The food safety Great. Uh, sensitive expenditures, we apportion, as I said, uh, the budgets um, depending on uh, the level of contribution to food safety. The other thing is to undertake consultation and get a consensus on the methods and the weights. Uh, so first within the the relevant uh, civil society organization with the uh, county government officials themselves and also the national government uh, entities. And for our case, we took the tool um, to uh, various counties and had uh, consultations with the relevant uh, people from different departments and build a consensus uh, on the same. Some of the major challenges that uh, still exist is the, the, the issue of coordination, um, especially achieving a consensus on what to include 
uh, especially on the food safety sensitive budget lines. Uh, uh, and also um, some, some, some technical challenges, which components and light line items to include and exclude. And also the issue of uh, the collection, how to, um, uh, to make it more routine and more, if you like, harmonized because uh, different counties upload uh, their uh, financial data or budget data at different times. And for the, uh, for the actual expenditure, uh, this is a challenge because it comes with about three years lag uh, because it has to be audited with the, uh, by the relevant um, uh, offices like the, uh, the Auditor General. And, and actually the, the actual budget data is more, if you like, is, is better because it tells uh, the actual situation uh, as compared to budgets which are uh, express the intention. So how does our budget tracking look like? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an MS Excel base, so it's easy. It's, it's made uh, user friendly. We sort of interface the underlying data with five or tables and also uh, dashboards for tracking, uh, easy to use. And if you like, uh, let me take you through. Basically, if you pick this, this is the images from the Excel sheet. So you will find um, data from different counties and also from national government, different departments, different budget lines, and different amounts across the years. Um, uh, four years, about 75 uh, budget lines ETC. So that is the raw data, basically getting it from um, uh, uh, the, the financial document and putting it in that format. Then you combine now, you, you sort of now, um, you combine the data, um, but still separate between recurrent and development. Um, and then you, you have a bit more synthesized data. Then you move forward now, you create a pivot uh, tables and charts uh, that captures the total budget. Uh, for that county of the, the national government, then you have the total daily food safety budgets and then the total horticulture uh, uh, food safety budgets. And after that, you can begin to, to, uh, to generate some results. For example, if you want to know um, by different financial years, how much do different uh, state departments or say Ministry of Health or others spend um, for daily food safety. You can be able to see, like I'm showing there, how many millions were spent. You can see who is doing the most um, and, and, and stuff like that. The other thing is that you can also now, over time, be able to track uh, what proportions of the national budget, for example, are dedicated to food safety. Uh, as you can see over the years, there has been um, a general increase, but is still about uh, lower than uh, 1%. Uh, here we are not making any judgment in terms of whether it's adequate or not, but already you can see a trend um, and you can see the levels in terms of the, the percentage of budgets. So from, from the tool, you can mine a lot of um, data, you can uh, see the expenditures by department, by years, over time, and, and you can uh, have a lot of discussion uh, around what that data means. And that is what the CSOs have been doing when they have been engaging the county and national government as far as food safety budgets are concerned. And what we have learned from this tracking work is that using a collaborative, and I have heard that word used before here, uh, what we are calling a triangle approach, where ourselves as the generators of um, evidence, working together with the civil society of an organization, SNV and government, uh, is better than um, a linear way where one, uh, one team sits somewhere, generates evidence and just comes and puts it on the table. Um, uh, uh, where the others have not been involved and they don't understand the data. So working collaboratively is better because all, 
all the stakeholders in, involved uh, get a good understanding of where the data is coming from and what it means. Um, also, the issue of capacity building for the CSOs, uh, you have to sensitize all the uh, government departments uh, so that they, they have the buy-in. And also, I think from what we have already been observing is that uh, the budget that is dedicated to food safety seems to be low and there is need uh, to increase that given that the challenges that we are facing in food safety are big and they continue to increase day by day. So that is basically my presentation and I thank you all for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Paul Budiga, for that um, very interesting presentation. And indeed, we've seen the, um, from his presentation that there is a link between the kind of investment we're making uh, in our budgets, both national and county government, and how this directly uh, correlates or affects um, food safety. So our next presentation is from um, Dr. Vivian Hoffman, a senior research fellow with IFTRI, and together with um, working with Voice for Change um, project, she was able to do her own research and provide us with evidence to link, to show us how the state of diseases is currently in Kenya and why we actually need more investment in food safety to address issues of um, food safety related to uh, foodborne diseases. So Dr. Vivian Hoffman, um, thank you so much and um, you can uh, make a presentation. Hello everybody, good morning. And thank you very much for including me in this panel. It's a great honor to speak with all of you today. Um, I'm just gonna get my slides up. Okay. So as Brenda said, I'm with the International Food Policy Research Institute. I've been based here in Kenya for two and a half years um, and working on the issue of food safety in Kenya for over 10 years. There's a lot of concern in Kenya these days that we hear about food safety hazards in the food system. And this isn't too surprising given what we know about how food safety evolves over time with the country's development. So typically food safety scholars um, observe that more traditional food systems um, have a lower burden of foodborne illness. And this is because the food system is quite simple. Food is produced close to where it is consumed and so there's not a lot of aggregation and opportunity for hazards to spread across large lots of food. Once you get to a transitional and modernizing phase of economic development, as Kenya is in now, um, you see the food systems becoming far more complex. And so there are increased opportunities for food to become contaminated as it sits for longer, travels further, and passes through a larger number of hands on the way to the consumer. What we typically see at this stage is that government starts to catch up with the need, as does the private sector. And so regulations start to be more effect effectively enforced, capacity is built in the private sector for um, adherence to standards. And so you, you begin to see the food safety burden decline in this red phase of modernization, which finally brings you to the end where you have a postmodern food system and the food safety burden in terms of the economic cost is lower than it started at. Now, what's important to realize about this diagram is that it's not automatic. It is a typical case, um, but of course the public sector and the private sector both have a lot of um, opportunities to improve how this goes. It's quite possible to stay in the yellow phase for a long time, and it's also quite possible to make this transition far more rapid. And that's what we're here today to talk about. How can we make this decline faster so that we have a lower burden of food safety, uh, foodborne disease more quickly in Kenya? What we have seen is that um, in country, or sorry, there we go, in countries that do fund their food safety systems adequately, we see a much lower burden of disease. So this is data from 35 countries taken from the World Health Organization, as well as national statistics, which shows that countries that adequately fund veterinary services 
have a far lower burden of disease. This is the years of healthy life lost to foodborne disease that is transmitted through animal products compared to countries where those veterinary services are not adequately funded based on WHO metrics. And turning to Kenya, um, we compared the shillings per capita that are um, spent on food safety according to the budget tracking exercise carried out by, by RESAX and ILRI um, against the estimated burden of foodborne disease converted from years of life lost to an economic cost by multiplying every year of life lost by per capita GDP. And so what we see is that both on a national level, um, where the food safety budgets are only around 265 shillings per person per year, um, and the cost of foodborne disease is over 2,000 shillings, as well as at all of the counties that we looked at, um, the burden of foodborne disease is far more expensive than the public investment to improve food safety. So this represents, I think, a real opportunity for action um, to cost effectively improve food safety in Kenya. We also did some research um, where we took nationally representative data on um, child diarrhea and looked at how that correlated with the foods that the children, that a child ate over the past 24 hours. So these are kids under two years of age. And we see as usual that children who are exclusively breastfed are much, more like, le much less likely to have had diarrhea in the past week. So these, this, is the law, this is basically zero, and you're less likely to have diarrhea if you are breastfed only. But those who consume some of the most healthy foods, such as milk, fish or self, shellfish, fr fresh fruits, um, these kids were also more likely to have suffered from diarrhea. And what I want to say here is not that children shouldn't be eating these nutritious foods. In fact, I think this, this result underscores that we really need to address food safety to make sure that the nutritious foods that children need to be eating are also not causing them to suffer diarrheal disease, which can lead to stunting and, and lifelong problems in health and also brain development. So just to close, um, the research that we have done through this project really shows that it is time for action. Um, the government can do a lot here, uh, the county government, the national governments, and, and also the private sector. I think the first step is to focus on the highest risk foods, right? So animal source foods, fresh produce. And I know the Ministry of Health um, is working on trying to develop a national food safety surveillance system. And this is a very important first step. Um, beyond developing such a surveillance system, which can help raise awareness and also create incentives for, for um, the private sector to deliver food safety. I think it's also really important and the public sector has a role in providing or promoting or both um, improved sanitation facilities, hand washing facilities with soap, especially for use by food handlers. Um, for example, in, in public markets, we need better facilities if, for people to keep themselves clean um, and keep food clean. And then finally, educating both food business operators and citizens about how to maintain food safety from farm to fork is, is a very important public role. Thank you very much. Yeah. Presentation. And um, yes, indeed, it is time for action. As, as you've been mentioned, that the correlation between the investment that you're making in food safety and the burden that um, food safety bond diseases are bringing onto our nation is quite dire. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Professor Erastas Kangeve, um, who, uh, who worked with the uh, University of Delhi and working with Voice for Change program as well. Um, they were able to do research and provide um, some insights into how Vietnam have been able to um, revolutionize their food safety system. And this definitely um, touches on to how we would want to uh, change our food safety system. What kind of module do we want to introduce into our food safety system to ensure that I'm making enough investment into the system and surveillance in, in place and learning from other countries that are similar to us, middle income countries such as Vietnam. So I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Rastas Kangeve, provide us with some insights into the study, uh, the case study that they did in Vietnam. And what lessons can we learn from uh, um, a similar organ, a country on how we can also uh, manage our own system and improve this. 
So, Professor Erasmus Kangebe, welcome. Uh, hello, Brenda. Um, uh, thank you. I, uh, Professor Kangebe is having difficulties uh, connecting. Um, I saw him online and then he disappeared. So, uh, I will step in and uh, take this next couple of minutes to talk about the case of Vietnam, if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Dr. Joseph Karakia, who works with ILRI, will be making this presentation as this is a study with Professor Kangeve and Dr. Joseph Karugia. So, Joseph, um, welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Brenda, you can put up the slide. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Karugia, and I work with an initiative known as RESAX, Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System, which is facilitated by the International Livestock Research Institute and the AURI and International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI. Um, the, the, the presentation was to be made by uh, Professor Kangede, one of our foremost experts on, uh, uh, on food safety in, in, in Kenya, but uh, he's not available uh, at the moment to, due to some technical issues. So I will uh, step in to, to his big shoes and uh, share uh, a few insights from the Vietnam uh, case study that we conducted uh, uh, some time back, uh, about a year or so ago. So from what we have had, um, we can say with uh, some degree of certainty that Kenya's food control system uh, needs improvement uh, to ensure that we have safe, uh, wholesome uh, food that is safe for humans and consumption and also is appropriately labeled uh, and, and, and so on according to, uh, to the existing laws. And to develop and improve this system, then we asked ourselves, what can we learn from a country that faced similar issues at more or less the same level of development um, that Kenya is in and, and so on. So we looked at the Vietnam uh, case and uh, picked some important lessons that are relevant for, for Kenya as we want to develop a, a, a food control system that works uh, for, to ensure that we have uh, safe food in the country. So the first thing that uh, you will want in this endeavor is, is really leadership. leadership at the highest levels of government. In Vietnam, the Prime Minister's office prioritized food safety as an important national goal. Um, in our case here, under the Big Four agenda, we have food security as one of the Big Four. Um, uh, we also, as a country, uh, subscribe to the Continental Framework for Agriculture De Development and Transformation, the CADEP and Malabo Declaration, which prioritizes uh, food safety. And indeed, uh, food safety is one of the areas that countries get assessed on uh, during uh, the African Union by annual review uh, mechanism. And of course, food safety is important, as has been mentioned before. Uh, in achievement of SDG2, Sustainable Development Goal number two on zero hunger, and Sustainable Development Goal number three of good health and well-being. So we need leadership that also that brings everybody who matters in this. On this And, and create a mechanism and uh, a, a few clear, issues here in uh, you reporting you know
Hi, Joseph. I think um, there's a few in connection issues. Maybe if you could um, start off your point again. Yeah, Joseph, I hope you can hear me. Um, you're having a bit of connection issues on your side. Could you kindly uh, kick off your last point once again? Um, most participants could not hear that last point that you made. Can, can you hear me, Brenda? Yes, 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 we can hear you now. Please continue. Sorry, so I, I was talking about to, uh, the 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 uh, Vietnam developing uh, a policy framework and regulations that um, Indians. Uh, sorry, Joseph, I think we've, we've lost you again. Uh, the connection seems to be um, poor on your end. If you can hear me, Joseph, um, the connection has dropped on your end. Um, but we did get the point on in terms of the policy and regulatory um, framework that Vietnam designed, ideally to address food safety. Uh, is it possible for you to share that point once again? Can, can you hear me now? Can can you can you hear me? Yes. Kindly continue. Oh, okay. Um, you, where did you want me to start again? I'm sorry, I didn't. Brenda, where would you I like? I think we kept. We are. We, I think if you could um, just um, continue first, begin with the first point: the policy and regulatory um, aspect of um, how Vietnam oh. tackles. All right. Yeah. yeah. So so. Uh, so Vietnam established a policy and a regulatory framework and uh, um, uh, delineating boundaries for the different uh, actors in the food safety arena, uh, eliminating redundancies, uh, duplication of efforts, uh, a clear reporting system, uh, as well as, uh, and, and therefore found it necessary to establish an overarching agency. And therefore, that led to establishment of new institutions and uh, resourced them. So you need new institutions that are well resourced and are fit uh, for the country context. Then um, they went ahead and developed uh, a surveillance, inspection, and laboratory. Uh, capacity. So you need to put funds into development of infrastructure for surveillance, uh, for inspection along the food chain, you know, nodes and so on. And of course, laboratories uh, for testing uh, samples collected. Another important aspect is coordination. As you will know, uh, and has been mentioned, food safety is more sectoral in nature. So there'll be different ministries, different uh, departments that need to contribute to an effective control system. And this needs to be coordinated. And this, it, it means that it cannot be left to one sector ministry. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, coordination is by the office of the prime minister and there is an intersectoral committee chaired by the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, yes. Um, 
And, and it's important to emphasize here that, you know, coordination is not simply, you know, occasionally sitting together and discussing issues of food safety. It's actually about joint action, um, continuous or repeated interaction by the different players, sharing of substantive information, and, 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 and of course, taking action based on the information shared, including coordinating activities, budgets, and so on. The other aspect that uh, they found necessary is capacity building, capacity building programs. Um, of course, we need capacity, human capacity uh, at all levels. Um, the university programs, uh, the, the teaching of um, teaching institutions have programs for training in the areas of food safety, uh, but also need to build capacity of the different value chain actors. And of course, all of these would be anchored on a food safety strategy that focuses on the goals of safe food uh, and, and food security, ensuring an, a working surveillance system uh, and, and, and of course, uh, prioritizing where do you really want to focus on? Because you can't be everywhere at all, at all times. You need to prioritize the, the food value chains and the relevant nodes to focus on uh, based, of course, on risk analysis. Um, these are important lessons for, 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 for Kenya. And uh, if we could adopt uh, many of these, uh, we would be a long way in developing, or go a long way in developing our own food control system that works for our context. I pause here. Thank you very much.